Hi, everyone. Um, so tomorrow is the feast of St. Bridget. And uh, I suppose we we wanted to talk and delve a little bit more about into St. Bridget's Day and particularly uh, the, the misconceptions um, about her. Um, there's I was surprised to discover that there's a lot of videos um, on YouTube in which um, feminists tried to claim St. Bridget as one of their own, implying that she was, oh, she was actually a pagan goddess and she was having a great time in, in ancient Ireland. Um, and the big, mean Catholic church came in with St. Patrick, all patriarchal. And um, now St. Bridget was a goddess and she was quite powerful. So the church couldn't just write her off as a goddess. So they made her a saint. And apparently that was a very patriarchal thing to do. Um, and also apparently these people, they made this ridiculous video for the repeal of the eighth, implying that St. Bridget actually participated in an abortion and that made her um, great. Um, and it just seems that there's a lot of, and even like not even Irish websites, these international um, channels um, claiming that she was actually a goddess and she's not really a saint at all. So myself and Augustine are just going to just delve into some of these uh, myths, um, literal myths, um, to try to, to flesh them out. Yeah. Um, the th yeah, the thing about St. Bridget's Day is that for, for people outside of Ireland, they might know that uh, St. Patrick is obviously the most famous saint we have, but St. Bridget is almost as important um, as being the patroness of Ireland. And so when they're able to attack St. Bridget and kind of try to corrupt her memory and stuff, it's a lot easier for them in some ways because Saint, everyone knows St. Bridget's Day is the first day of spring, it's the first day of February. And when you're going to school in Ireland, you have to learn to make St. Bridget's crosses, um, which is uh, people outside Ireland, some of them might be familiar with it if you're from a, an Irish background, but the St. Bridget's cross is kind of um, a skewed kind of shape of a cross. And it's said that it was made by St. Bridget to explain to a pagan king on his deathbed what the cross was. So it's a very powerful symbol. And St. Bridget, like St. Patrick, is kind of mixed in with the idea of being Irish, of the identity of being Irish. So in the past number of years, like if they came out and they said, well, St. Patrick was actually, you know, I don't know, trans or something, people would be saying, well, that's just ludicrous. But with St. Bridget, she goes under the radar a little bit. So, And feminists have really co-opted her. And they've been really successful at it in the past couple of years. As you said, even during the repeal of the eight referendum, they, they managed to even associate her with abortion and associate her with these kind of modern kind of things. And the, the interesting thing about it was that St. Patrick, we have his words that he wrote himself in his confessio, his confession, where he spoke about his own life and, and kind of uh, his story of being a slave and wanting to return to the Irish people to help them and how he heard the Irish people calling them and things like that. But with Bridget, even though Bridget was an important person because she was an abbess in Kildare, so she, she ran the monastery, um, it's still, she, we don't have her account of her life the same way we do with Patrick. So we do have a couple of other accounts and one of them is kind of a bit matter of fact, and one of them is a bit kind of fantastical, uh, telling kind of mad stories about her. And so the feminists who wouldn't believe any of the stuff about the miracles in the church, they've kind of picked up on this one little story of Bridget where it said um, that she, there was a woman who didn't want to be pregnant, and she said a prayer or a blessing or a spell or whatever it was, and basically, you know, whatever was in the womb disappeared. And you have to remember, this was written, if I'm not mistaken, I think in the 800s. So you're talking like 400 years uh, before someone like Aquinas. And even he couldn't understand uh, the idea behind what was going on in the womb. So when he talked about when life begins. So, you know, the idea that what's in that is somehow binding yeah. that St. Bridget supported abortion. I mean, it's ludicrous. But... uh. But they really, yeah, as you said, repeal the, eight, repeal the Eight was the big focal point for this, wasn't it?
Yeah, yeah, it really was. There, the that she was actually like almost like a sorceress and engaging in, in magic and spells. And it's kind of like to her, they see her as some as what they think the ideal woman should be. They're almost like trying to make her out to be this woke Wonder Woman or something, which it's completely fantastical since it was, it was, I think it was in the sixth century that she was born. Um, but somehow yeah. these people, yeah. they, they denigrate any sort of faith. Um, well, they mainly denigrate Catholicism, but they're willing to swallow all these like ridiculous accounts of, of her life to say, oh, therefore, Bridget, she actually wasn't a saint. She was more of a goddess. And she is, um, but th they're still attributing religious belief in her, although it's, it's quite warped. Um, it, their whole approach to her is completely inconsistent. Yeah. And see, I suppose they have to try and, they have to take down a figure like her because she she is a woman who was a powerful figure in the church. She was so powerful that there's an image, I think, in, I think it's in Minute Chapel in the college, where she is, um, now at the time, I think an abbot, could, you know, the abbot would or ordain priests. So some people have put together this painting that's done in the chapel where people think that She's carrying what looks like a, a bishop's crozier, saying that she could ordain priests. So she, I, you know, yeah. we don't have any evidence that she could, but we do know she was definitely a powerful figure. You know, because uh, the some of the abbeys at the time would have men in one part and women in the other. So she was the abbess. She was over the whole thing. So she was a powerful figure. So it's very hard for these women to understand, or like the, it's not just women. We have to be to be fair, like people who are feminists or people who are modernists in the church, yeah. it's hard for them to accept that in the medieval period or early medieval period, you know, the the woman had more power than even she would in society now, that the church actually did give them a lot of power and a lot of authority. So they have to kind of twist it and warp it to say, well, oh no, well, she only had power because she was, a, you know, a goddess or she was a, a pagan, you know, and, They've mixed yes. Bridget, you know, there's only, they've mixed Bridget with the old pagan goddess of Bridget. But I mean, they're kind of forgetting that there's only so many days in a year and there's only so many names that somebody can have. So if you think of all the different saints in Europe and different saints days, it actually is a small amount of them that actually overlap with the pagan ones. But people focus on the few exceptions like Bridget or Halloween, and they say, oh, well, that's not a real holiday. They actually just stole that from the pagans. But if you pick any particular day, you're talking, you could be talking dozens of saints and um, any number of, of feast days that are celebrated. So people just pick up on these little things, and they just kind of try to isolate them and warp them, you know? And it's, it's a big... I think Bridget is a real problem for them, isn't she? Because Bridget shows that you know, it's not about men having power over women. It's just about people having the right place in the church. A lot of miracles, um, healing people. There's, there's kind of a funny story, but it's about turning water into beer. Did you see that one? This was the one with um, with Bridget. Yeah, apparently there were some lepers and uh, there was some water and she just turned it into beer and gave it to him. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, it rings a yeah. bell. I can't remember the exact one, but that's pretty good. Um, yeah. Well, it's kind of, kind of analogous to turning the water into wine. Um, but she also yeah. uh, cured a lot of people. There was a, a young... A girl who couldn't speak uh, since birth, and she miraculously cured her. And and as opposed to to atheists, they like who just reject the concept of miracles. They're more willing to glom onto like a ridiculous 
this count of, oh, it's magic, you know, instead of like uh, God's grace being performed to her. Um, how did the myth then, how was she associated? So just say like the, in their minds, she was this goddess and her father was a god and her mother was a goddess and they were, they had all this magic. Like, where did this come from? Well, part of it is to do with, with the name and the date that they're, they're conflating the two of them um, with the older pagan goddess um, of the same name. But the, another part of it too is that they, um, like people didn't really believe this, you know, hundreds of years ago. It's really becoming, it's really become some sort of weird, um, you know, twenty first century kind of phenomenon that, it, it, you know, it, it was a theory maybe a hundred years ago, maybe fifty years ago, but now it's becoming a thing that it you have a group of women who want to have their own kind of little indigenous religion, their own little indigenous flavor to uh, their culture that they see other places having, and they they've kind of turned their back on Catholicism. So for them kind of delving deep into into just completely blowing up this idea that well Bridget was actually just the same as this later Saint Bridget and uh, they're both different ideas of the same type of goddess you know like a, like Romans and, and Greeks having the same type of gods you know and so for some of them um, it's it's become a real kind of political thing and th- there's and it's an identity thing like there was a story or there was a website called Her Story that was launched a couple of years ago, and uh, they put up the most absurd thing I've I've ever seen. Um, they had this campaign saying it's time to make Bridges Day a national holiday, and basically they put up on it. Um, so they wrote the first of February marks the beginning of spring. Okay, matter of fact, I guess, and the Celtic festival of Imbolc. Now, the Celts had lots of festivals, so, I mean, you're going to overlap with them on different different days, you know? And once honoured as the Feast of the Goddess. Yeah. So it was, um, they are saying it did coincide. Um, now, like, this is the funny thing. So then it says, uh, to reignite this epic ritual, uh, the Her Story Light Festival take place over the weekend of Bridget's Day every year. So thank God for the virus that that hasn't been allowed to happen this year. Um, it is time we celebrated Ireland's triple goddess and matron saint equally to our world-renowned patron, St. Patrick. Now, okay, so they're kind of saying, like, you know, we should celebrate her as a triple goddess um, instead of saying we should celebrate her as St. Bridget. And notice that when they say, Bridget's Day. They're not saying Saint Bridget's Day. So it's clever. It's actually very clever stuff because they've even started doing this in a lot of towns in Ireland now. They're having these puka festivals. And a puka, like the, the puka thing is basically, uh, you know, it, 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 it has demonic undertones to it. It's a pig. Like when the pagans did this stuff, they did this stuff because they had no other knowledge. So when the pagans got knowledge of Christianity, the pagans said, yeah, Halloween sounds a lot better to me than than the whole Puka festival thing. Um, but these guys have knowledge of Christianity and paganism, but they're deliberately kind of saying, we're going to pick paganism despite Christianity. And it, it, it goes on, and it says, um, yeah, I mean, it's like they're trying to catch, um, you know, pick up on this kind of... Um, uh, nativist kind of uh, flavor for having your own indigenous culture, um, but in a really weird um, yuppie sort of way. So it says, uh, in in our post-true times, it's easy to get caught up in the facts and the endless game of proving them right or wrong. If we return to the bard collective stories from our ancestors, we reawaken the true Irish spirit and powerful archetypes of the Tua de Donan. Fact or fiction Mythology is packed with wisdom that is waiting to be rediscovered. So then it says, truth be I've told. I've seen them mention it too at the dawn on a few times. Yeah. And then it says, it says, truth be told. So after telling us, it's not about right or wrong, but truth be told, 
Bridget was a pan-European goddess. And then it goes into all this stuff, uh, long-winded stuff about her coming from Germany and her femininity, blah, blah, blah. And then it goes on to say she's a triple goddess because uh, something about water, fire, and poetry. Again, I mean, this is, th- this her story is very clever because they were sent in schools. They have a thing on RTE now, which is quite incredible. The RTE are broadcasting them every week or so. And yeah, so they're saying to schools, like primary schools, they're, they're going into the likes of, say, uh, the non-religious schools, and they're saying, oh, we know you can't, you know, you probably don't want to do St. Bridget's Cross because that's uh, offensive to the non-Irish or the non-Catholic kids. So why don't you do this Bridget's Day? And if anyone complains that you're not doing St. Bridget's Day, you can say, we are doing it. It's Bridget's Day, and we're doing history, and we're doing culture, and, and so on and so on. And um, wow. it goes on and on. And look, see, they've, they've actually taught this all out because then it says, uh, Bridget, something, fire and water. It's known in Eastern traditions as the yin and yang. And then it keeps going on and saying, it's a bridge from the pagan to Christian winter and spring. Um, but the interesting thing is that it then calls her a modern icon. They have a picture of her flinging a St. Bridget's cross and she kind of... She's dressed up like she's a, an action hero or something. It, it's, it's from some story. But then, okay, it does mention Kajitos' story. Um, and it calls her, like, this is, the, this is the wildest thing. It says, Ireland's yeah. matron saint is our first recorded abortionist. Because um, it says that she restored a nun's chastity. And then it says, yeah, it says that's recorded in the annals. Um, and then it says she was also a lesbian sharing her bed with a woman. Uh, you know, and it has it in quotation marks as though sharing a bed with a woman would be the same as being a lesbian. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then it says, and then it's, it's actually very interesting that they put this up. I mean, Bridget may be an anomaly for Catholicism, but one thing is for sure. She represents true Christianity. Like what? <laughs> like, you know, um, that doesn't make that, any sense. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. And then the next line is, um, in the 21st century, she reemerged as a fitting heroine of the marriage equality and repealed the eight referendums, bought extraordinary victories of compassion. Um, you know, which is interesting because um, Bridget would have been a uh, would have been close to Saint Conlet, who was a saint from also from Kildare. And there's a statue of St. Conlet in Kildare where he has a, a child. He's carrying a child, like giving it a piggyback. And, um, you know, to equate that type of compassion with the so-called compassion of killing a baby, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's, wild. it's just nonsense, absolute nonsense. And if you go to the website and you go through the collaborators, I mean, National Women's Council of Ireland, so basically government-funded... Uh, fake feminism. Yeah. U- University of Oxford. Uh, thank you, British University, for that. Trinity College yeah. Global Development Society. And then all these other things, waking the feminists, all these fake groups that bled the taxpayer dry um, during repeal the aid. And then just an absolute wild collection of, uh, you know, there's a picture of some fella here with a scarf around him. He's carrying a cat. And just an absolutely Irish Palestinian solidarity com- campaign. Like I'm not really sure what the the connection between those two there is. And there's one of them here, which I won't name because she's just very bland. But there's one woman who was calling for the Angelus to be banned a couple of weeks ago, and then she had this terrible comedy show on a while back as well that was making fun of the Virgin Mary. And um, oh, yeah. you know this this seems to have involved an awful lot of people for an awful lot of effort um, just for absolute nonsense. And a lot of people who seem to be working on it, they have their things here, some of the PhDs, some of them seem to be people high up in corporate stuff. And it's really just absolute, it's just garbage. And the, the point is anyway, it's really trying to, you find this a lot, like especially, you find this with a lot of younger people now that they're going to college, they're, re, they're studying uh, whatever it is, arts degrees, whatever degree they're studying, you read the same stuff anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, but 
they're reading all this Marxist theory, all this critical race theory, all this feminism, these boring people like Judith Butler and Adorno and all these people. And what's happened is when they're reading it, all the, the stuff these people write is gobbledygook. It's absolute garbage. It doesn't go anywhere. It's not true to life. And the reason it's like that is because um, they're just making it up. And they're trying to convince you that, oh, no, you're just too stupid to understand it. Like if I pick up St. Patrick's Confession, I can't remember how many pages it is, but you could read it, you know, you could read it front to back having a, a cup of tea. And yeah. that's a more powerful work that anyone can read. And it, it doesn't have any airs of grace, but I know can read it and enjoy it and it's powerful and it's true. But these other ones, they have to be highfalutin, they have to be long-winded because they're just full of nonsense. That's exactly what the her story thing is. And it's exactly what the whole St. Bridget was a triple goddess, earth, wind, fire, yin, yang. They have to go all around the world just to hide from the fact that St. Bridget was born into paganism. Her father was a chieftain. Um, St. Bridget became, St. Bridget was a, a Christian and she converted lots of the pagans because paganism is a bad thing, you know? And that's, the, the truth is, it's just so simple and they have to go so long around it to get to where they, they need to. Yeah. Um, and it's probably no accident that these people are trying to sort of revive paganism because paganism didn't really, it it, it never really had the the respect for the culture of life that Christianity has. Yeah. And uh, there, was a, there was a quote from G.K. Chesterton. Um, I came across it earlier, but I'd seen it before, which was that um, the pagans, pagans of old were wiser than the pagans of today because the pagans of old converted to Christianity. So the ones of today, you know, they, they don't... Um, they're doing it for other reasons, you know. And so yeah. in, in Ireland now, in Ireland, I mean, we're not going to see, we're not going to see a rise in atheism as such. Atheism, I don't think, gives people a kick, you know. Um, what gives people a kick is, you know, having something to be attached to. People still have that, you know, maybe it's a sociological religious need, but people have a need for it. And so, I think in the next few years, what we're going to see is is a rise in evangelical kind of religion in Ireland, partly kind of pushed by migration coming in. Uh, you're already kind of seeing it now. If you look in Dublin, a lot of these churches are popping up in shopping centres and other places and and hotels. And then the other thing we're going to see, we've already seen a big rise in kind of like Buddhism, yoga type of stuff. Um, but the other thing that I think we're going to see a rise in is that whole kind of neo-pagan kind of thing. And um, I just don't know. Yeah, so the church is in a funny spot about what to do about that because some people would argue, I mean, they're just abandoning the idea of St. Bridget and they should be fighting their corner in, in taking this back. So some people would argue they need to get back to its roots in Ireland, you know what I mean, to appeal to people here, because um, St. Bridget means a lot to people. Yeah, I mean, all you have to do is go on YouTube and look up St. Bridget. Most of the videos are to do with, with these from mythical Ireland and her status as a goddess, and she was only really co-opted as a saint by the church as a political move because she was so part of and all this stuff, and the, the few th um, videos you see talking to, about her as a saint, um, they're very quite short videos, actually. So I, I think it's good that we've kind of reignited this um, and just showing like the, um, the, the factual side instead of just uh, glomming on to a mixture of, of myths at that time and, and then saying QED, um, Bridget was actually an abortionist, a feminist uh, lesbian. It's, <laughs> the the thing the thing about these people it's so they they kind of don't know when to stop like they couldn't just say she's a feminist or a feminist and a lesbian but she has to be a feminist lesbian abortionist triple um, goddess <laughs> yeah triple goddess and it's it's just so fantastical and and that makes her like the patron saint of like the repeal movement and uh, 
and the repeal the eighth referendum as well. That that video from the repeal the eighth movement that it, it actually featured an actress playing Saint Bridget. Um, it's it's the whole thing is ridiculous from start to end, but it features a lot of like Irish, um, extremely liberal uh, actors and actresses, and I I was struck by the production values and they gave a long list of credits and they cited a lot of of these sort of astroturf movements that arose at the um, repeal movement. It it just struck me how these people have like a they had an unlimited um, uh, a stream of money. Some of it sta- state funded, some of it from d- from dark sources, uh, un um, unaccounted for. And they also have like so many actresses and actors, and even like video experts who can do this for them. Um, they just have a, a, a weaponry of of media at their disposal people on the traditional side don't have because we, we tend not to be to be in those industries and to have those sources of funding. Yeah. I think that's just where, I mean, the only thing you have on your side there is just resourcefulness and, uh, and you just hope. I mean, I, I kind of quote Chesterton a lot. Maybe I've, <laughs> maybe I've internalized more of his stuff than I thought, but he said, you know, the truth is like a lion, just uh, let set it free and it'll defend itself. And so, but it's, it. you also have to think about, you know, how you set it free. Like I thought during the, the referendum to me, like w- was a, a lesson in the fact that, you know, you, you can't just sit back, say your piece and say, all right, that's it, I'm done. I mean, these people are relentless and they're determined. And the actual pool of people in in Catholic circles in Ireland, or you know, who are actually willing to defend the stuff uh, properly, is very small. And even the people who seem like they're defending it, like sometimes they're they're not really. They're just kind of going through the motions. So it's kind of um. The only thing I'd say is, though, I mean for all their money um, and everything else, I don't... The the biggest effect I think they've had is just that people just don't want to think about it. So in other words, like, there's some things in life where you're bombarded with it so much that... You kind of broke up there. So I was saying, like, there's, there's some things in life where you're bombarded with it so much that to to go against the culture by thinking the other way requires too much energy so some people just choose not to so some people so it's the yeah. same with 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 the repeal stuff they just uh bombarded people with with it so much so much information that people were like well i'd have to you know it's just going to take me a long time if i want to prove them wrong so i'm just going to tune out from it so um so in ireland yeah i don't know but it's the same same we're in a funny spot that we have a lot of work to do to um get back get people back thinking about the faith again but i think um i think something like this is important because you are engaging with the culture you know people are interested yeah. in saint bridget but they're just they're coming up with you know saint bridget was a was a member of the social democrats who was vegetarian vegan you know yeah. it's uh but it's if it's what people are interested in and it, even if it it's directly relates to the faith, but even if it loosely relates to the faith, that's you know an opportunity, and that shouldn't be missed. And it feels like the church misses a lot of that stuff. Yeah, I, I personally feel like on the the issue of abortion, just talk about that. I I personally, and I'm I'm pretty sure I speak for you as well. I I haven't accepted this. I just because something is law doesn't mean oh well, lads, we gave it our best shot and. <clears throat> Time to go home now. But as uh, as we've had private conversations in the past, it, it, it's that's not the end. I mean, and just because the it's been taken out of the constitution doesn't mean laws can be made in the future which which make abortion illegal. And there are acts that can pass in the Rockus. Um, TDs can fight and stand and and constantly 
fight for the battles, just it's just even the small battles of the the pain uh, medication, the anesthetic question for mm. um, fetuses before, and it's 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 almost. In- you people are going to do this anyway. If you're going to take this, the life of this being, at least give it some anesthetic. And we, we know the reason they're not doing that. It's, um, that's been, they have that's to, been they have to admit it. Um, they have to admit it to be in there. You know? in so many ways. And, and we, yeah, we can't, we, we, we can't accept it. Um, there, there is many things we could do to push back against it. Yeah. And it's, um, I, yeah, and I would say that the big thing about it is just sometimes just keep talking about it, just keep people interested. Um, and something like this is where you can talk about it, but you're not actually talking about it directly and you're not preaching to people. So you're not saying to people, um, mm. look, don't get an abortion, you know, abortion is murder. You're actually, you're actually getting to have a proper conversation about something people are interested in. Okay, well, suppose Bridget had the power that if somebody was pregnant, could she say a prayer that uh, the baby would, <laughs> whatever, you know? Why is that possible? Why is yeah. that not possible? You know, yeah. what's the church teaching? When did the church teaching start? And so you're actually having, it's something people are interested in, and, you, and, you're, and you can have a constructive and very interesting conversation with them on it, you know? So that's, I think that is a, uh, I think sometimes we just, I don't know, just lack a bit of creativity in, in what really interests people or how to get through the people on it. Uh, I want to bring up some, something that's away from St. Bridget, but it's, it's pretty interesting anyway. I recently saw, um, recently it was the, um, the anniversary of the Supreme Court Deciding on Roe versus Wade in 1973, January 22nd, 1973 is when they when they decided Roe versus Wade, when the U.S. government legalized abortion. I think it was yeah. from the the History Channel, and they are kind of making it out as it was a great um, day for civil rights. And they also said, interestingly, um, the roots of this new law came in from the newly established physicians trade organization, the American Medical Association. Doctors decided that abortion practitioners were unwanted competition and went about eliminating that competition. So these people are trying to frame right. the position of the doctors to abortion as, yeah, couched in selfish... Um, uh, ...motives. And they all... Also, go on to say the Catholic Church, which had, which had been pregnant, field practice. So it's strange that they're saying, "Oh, the Catholic Church was actually pro-abortion for a long time, anyway." Um, which, like a lot of liberal media outlets, is is uh, it's just fallacious on the face of it. Right. I never actually knew that um, that aspect to it that they wanted to. Um, introduce it to monetize it which is part of the which was part of the reason here is that it's um it's lucrative for a lot of people you know i mean companies got the contracts to provide the equipment for it uh, con- uh companies got the contracts to you know deck out the um abortion wards in the maternity hospitals and um so a lot of people profited from it and plus the doctors here get I mean, I think it started off. Was it four fifty per abortion here? I, I think it's gone up a hundred since. Heard, yeah. yeah, as far as I know, they got a a, a, bo- a raise of a hundred euro, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So there's definitely money in it. If you think in the UK, I mean, the in the UK, is it two? Is it two in five pregnancies end in abortion? Am I right on that? I thought it was one in five. One in five, one in five, yeah. So, um, I mean, that's that's a lot of people, and it's such a big population. So, 
yeah, there's money in it. Same with euthanasia. You know, we, we could talk about this another time. Um, but with euthanasia possibly coming in here now too, I mean, you know, they're not taking people out to a field and shooting them in the head. You know, they're getting paid a fee. They're clocking in and clocking out. And uh, someone's going to get the contract for all this stuff too. So it's, um, yeah, that's that's what's going on. Like, And, and the, it, the other and side of it, Go ahead. And it, there's, it's expensive for the state to care, to care for the elderly. Yeah. But should this, uh, even the... They just cease uh, to live. Yeah, I mean, they have... Um, you have elderly people in Ireland now. Like, I don't know if they have this in other countries that you know, families are happy enough to do this because it's better than, it's better than nothing. But, I mean, if, if we were a... A competent country this this wouldn't be an issue but people now are only a lot of them when they go to nursing homes they have to sign this deal with the government where they're basically giving up their land so that they can get cared for in the nursing home you know which is uh anyway it's it's certainly not charitable whatever it is no no definitely not um but yeah but go anyways i suppose going back to St. bridget I think that type of stuff, it gets Irish people interested. Even the pro-aborts are interested in this traditional kind of saint. So it's um, we could look at it as a negative that they've, they've crafted these stories around her. But, I mean, to look at the positive, people, will, people sometimes taunt the church and say it's irrelevant and this and that. Depends what you mean by the church, you know. Um, if you mean the NGOs and things like that, you know, whatever, but certainly the the things that the church has upheld for the past um, sixteen hundred years or whatever here um, are certainly not irrelevant. And like the St. Bridges stuff kind of proves that that they're just so desperate to have proclaimed as one of them. Yeah, I suppose what we're doing is uh, we're basically claiming her back, giving her her rightful uh, place in um. In the history of of, of, uh, of Irish saints, yeah, and you know it's not. Um, I mean, people might people might disagree with me on this here. I don't know how to phrase it right, but a lot of Irish people are naturally interested in, you know, the that world, but um, that Celtic um, crossover between the the pagan traditions and the Gaelic form of Catholicism and it should be embraced, you know, it shouldn't be ignored. It should be embraced and people should go to, go to Kildare, go to St. Bridget's um, round tower or the, the round tower near the, the church. Um, they should go to St. Bridget's well. They should go to the places Patrick came to and things like that. And uh, it should, it should be embraced because it's a powerful thing, you know, that, that mix of the identities. Um, and, and St. Patrick's Day is kind of a, a testament to that, that if you don't claim it but, and make the most of it, it's uh, going to turn into something else. Yeah. 